Hey, folks, I'm going to try to make this the shortest pre-roll in the history of Houndsman XP. Heath and I dive into bear season, wrap it up. We hear a great bear hunting story. Probably saw Heath's uh, video that he posted on social media. Well, this is the in-depth story. And then we're going to dive into gear reviews. We're going to talk about what worked, what hasn't worked, how we need to change some things. And hopefully you can pick up a few things to improve your kit, your functionality, your comfort, and your survival in the field while you are out hunting with your hounds. We got a box shaker here, folks. Let's get the tailgate down. Time to dump the box. We're wrapping up bear season for 2022, and I mean, you're probably hunting again tomorrow, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Did you kill any bears? Did you tree any bears today? No. Um, I worked, so Tuesday was a 16-plus hour day. I had to get up and go to work. For what? Oh, oh, because you, cause you killed yes. the bear. Yes. You actually killed a bear. I did. And um, I don't know why. I mean, it was a split second. I didn't have nowhere to go. It didn't have nowhere to go. <laughs> we was on top of a cliff, and one of us had to give in, and it wasn't going to be me. I had, Kate, <laughs> I had I literally had Kate in one hand. When when she backed up, I had all, I had all six dogs in a hole. And I've had several people message me wanting to hear this story. <clears throat> so I'll kind of give you the, the let's back. tell it. let's tell it let's just tell let's kick the podcast off with a Heath Hyatt epic bear story yeah it, yes if that's if that's the case <clears throat> so uh Tuesday morning um struggling we're to end of the season or at the last week uh I had canine training Monday so I did not get to hunt they all hunted Monday and then you know fuzz and forest I had to go back to work uh Hot Rod's got a litter of puppies. He's he's got occupying him. Uh, Greg and Hunter Hunter's been sick, so everybody's kind of out. <clears throat> so Chelsea decides she wants to go with me, and so we go up to the place that you and I normally go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I I like to hunt that, and it's hard hunting by yourself. So Wesley yes. didn't he didn't decided he didn't want to get out. You know, he was going to be a truck man today. Him and Clayter. <clears throat> we're up top and then later's the best truck man around yeah i'm just going to shout out to clater right now that guy i like that guy yeah and uh Clay, clater's that guy the guy we always talk about on the podcast he doesn't own a dog mm -mm. he's got a toyota truck he's got a radio he's got a garmin he's got a dog box he's got all the things that he's the smartest guy in the group for sure <laughs> because he doesn't have the dogs mm -hmm. and uh you know, he's not messing with hounds, but he's always there to pick you up when you walk through one of those Laurel Hell holes or off the face of the north or off of the other side to the to the east. Gee whiz, I, lo I love Clater. Clater's my hero. So they were up top with me. Um, Big Sam, we call him Rawhide, uh, Dave, and Fred were on the bottom. So this is a about a nine mile trek through um from top to bottom and so they i had people on the top people on the bottom so <clears throat> we just take off with the dogs and walk and you know I, i've got little spots that i like to hit that i've had really good luck through the years and we got we got to the bottom um down down past i even hunted the area where brad killed his i even went into that stuff and hunted nothing nothing the only thing that i seen was fresh coat crap that was it and it was mm. everywhere so we got down to the well brett there's got to be a bear left alive in there because brad and derek said they got growled at in there in that laurel thicket Do you well, hear yeah. that podcast yeah um and maddie and i trade one the the week after down in there a nice bear and left it like we yeah we treated just me and her was down in there too um yeah so yeah, there's there's several bears still in there, but so we'd hunted that area and we got up to a split in the path where you either go out or you go back up and around and you can come out. And I'm like, well, you know, it's a nice day. Let's just go up and around and, and come out the top side and drop off the mountain. So there's a little ridge in there that, that I've had really good luck on. So we crossed through that area, checked that, that area out, and nothing. I mean nothing. So 
we're just kind of piddling at this point. I mean, it's up in the morning, um, 10 30 or so. And <clears throat> we start off the mountain. We stop, take a few pictures and we start, I mean, literally I'm eight tenths of a mile from the truck. So I'm dropping off the mountain and we get to the first, like kind of the switch back in the, the road and the path. And Attica, one of the pups, she starts barking on the lead. We had to put her on the lead because she was running everything under the sun all the way down through there. And frankly, we just got tired of having to wait on her and, and round her up. So we had her on the lead. She starts opening on the lead. Well, Spook and Kate take off up the hill, up the mountain. And Spook goes left-handed. He opens a time or two. Kate goes with him, but she flips around and comes back. And then, and I'm watching her on the garment. She hadn't said anything. When she comes back to where Spook turned left, she goes right and she goes up. She gets about 196 yards or so, and then she starts yodeling. Well, when Kate's yodeling, you know, it's game She's on. Looking at it. Yeah. So I don't know if she just jumped it out of its bed. I, I don't know. But anyway, Spook turned. He heard her. He went to her. Um, they were getting ready to top over the mountain back where we just come from. So uh, I went ahead and packed the dogs, and it was kind of a cluster. Two two of the dogs got got messed up. They dropped back down in the path that I was in, <clears throat> and um, they ended up running out the path. But by that time, Kate and Spook had come across the path, so they were able to cut that cut it. Well, by the time I pulled back up to the top and got where I could hear, they were caught. And, I mean, they were just bellering. And they made a they made a long loop down, and they turned and come right back up. So, you know, Chelsea and I standing there in the in the path. This like, it's going to come right out at us. 130 yards, well, it turns, and it goes right back down out of there. So, it goes into some rough country, and... When I realize it's going to cross over, like, I just book it. Like, I book it out of there. I told Chelsea, I'm like, you know where this is at. You, this is where you need to go to. That's where they're at. Just go right there. So I take off, and... She probably outran you. Oh, we're going to get into that. We're we, we going to get into that. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, I mean, I'm literally high-stepping it down through there and i get parallel with the dogs they're across they've done cross this valley cross the creek um and they're running parallel with me and i'm literally like parallel with them 120 are you doing like last of the mohicans run through the woods it was pretty much i mean it's more rolling for me (laughs) but yeah we're gonna start calling you hawkeye (laughs) so i 120 yards and i can't see the dogs i can't see what they're doing and they went all the way down the creek well, I holler at Wes. He's come around to the bottom side by this point. And I said, is anybody else in here? And he goes, no, but I can be. He goes, you need me. And I'm like, well, I'm good. I got it. Don't worry about it. Well, I think he was thinking I probably should get in there. So he he ends up getting ready and starts coming up in there. Well, the dog's turned. Which isn't an easy feat. No. Where he was at. No. <clears throat> so the dog's turned, come back through a bunch of rock ledges and cliffs and just, I mean, just really, really bad country. And I was telling Wesley that, you know, when I hunted in this area 20 years ago, I spent a lot, a lot of time in there. I'd, I'd get hung up in them ledges a lot. I get the, the bear get away. So they come up parallel with me again and I'd run back up the mountain and I'd run into Chelsea and she's like, where have you been? I'm like, I told you where to go. Like, She's like, well, you might have me in tears because I thought I was lost. And I was like, well, you got a radio. Just turn the radio on. I can tell you where to go to. So right. <clears throat> um, long story short, they ended up turning. And they, go, they go back. They go another contour line up. And they go back down the mountain. And they stop. And, I mean, I'm, I'm 600 yards, 575, 600 yards, you know, by the crow fly. I can hear the dogs barking. Wesley's coming up from the bottom. He gets right below them, and they're not moving. But we know they're on a cliff. Like, Mm -hmm. we know they're they're on a cliff. So I tell Chelsea, I'm like, I'm going down here. I'm going to cross at this point because I know I can cross the creek there. And then I'm just going to 45-degree angle 
to them. And it's going to take me a bit, but that's what I'm going to do. And she wanted to go, and I told her no. I was like, you stay here. Like, it's too rough in there. Like, it's a mess. You just stay here. So she stayed. It probably took me an hour, <clears throat> maybe an hour and a half. It took me a while to get to them. But what happened is when I crossed the creek and started pulling, I ran into a, a rock face, and I had to go around it. But then I realized that the wind was blowing at my the back of my head, so it was going up the mm-hmm. mountain. And yeah. I'm like... If I go in below them and it smells me, it's going to bust out of there and I'm going to be SOL because I'm, I'm basically in here by myself. Yeah. So I made the decision to go ahead and pull up to the same contour line before I started going out to them. So that's what I did. Took me a little extra time to do that. That's not what I had planned. And I get up and I'm, I get up to the contour line they're on and I start walking and, well, crawling, like literally crawling over and under and through and scaling some ledges like i mean this is probably one of the most excruciating hunts i've done this year um physically so i get into a a open area and i see a track in the mud in the clay mud and i'm like if that's what i'm running that's a good bear yeah so i didn't say anything i just kept going while i got i got over around that ridge and down into a hollow and there was like a, a little waterfall and stuff coming off the mountain. And I got into some mud. And then I seen it. And I seen the dog tracks. So I hollered on radio and I told Wesley, I was like, Wesley, this this is a good bear. Like I can I can see the track. The tra- the his his um toes were way bigger than my thumbs. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Yeah, that's a good bear. So I'm not hearing the dogs, and I'm gay I mean, I'm a hundred, hundred and twenty five yards. And it still takes me a lot of time to get to them. So I'm not hearing the dogs and I'm hollering at them. By this time, Chelsea's with Wesley and they're like, yeah, we can hear them barking. And so. Isn't that crazy? When mm -hmm. you you got dogs down over a face like that. Yep. You can be, you can be a hundred, less than a hundred yards away and not hear them. Chris, I was 20, 20 yards before. So Maggie, my black female, I got 60 yards. And my pup Attica come to me, and I was wall. I, I was between sixty and forty, I guess. Well, then I see my black jip come up over the hill, and I'm like, "What is she doing?" I look on my Garmin. Everybody's still like tight, and I do have question marks. Um, I guess I wasn't paying enough attention to that because everything else was going on, but I got question marks. <clears throat> Y'all have to excuse my cough, but um, so I, I step up onto the cliff. I'm up on this cliff now, and I'm like, well, okay, where did the dogs go? And I walk to the edge of the cliff, and I can hear them, and they're up underneath me. Well, yep. then, I, then Maggie comes out. Then I realize I've got six dogs in a hole on the side of a cliff. So I would got Maggie out from where the hole was to where I was standing. It was about a four, four and a half, five foot drop. And then there's a shelf and the shelf, you either go off the cliff or you can go through some rocks and back up over to the top. Mm-hmm. Of. So I got Maggie, I start hollering. I'm getting, the dogs are coming to me. So I'm getting them tied back and I have to pull them up over this ledge and I've got them all tied up back except Kate. And Kate's just in there just, yo, 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 yo. I mean, just, she just, I mean, she's just hammering. And I can hear at this point in time, I can hear it blowing and, bluffing her and smacking the ground like i can hear that and i'm like crap so then i've got to make the decision how am i going to get kate out of here without it knocking her off this cliff and without getting myself killed so i make the decision to jump to to jump down on that 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 shelf and i start toning kate and she's not budging she's just in there yo 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 she's fully committed i i can hear her I can hear her, um, sorry, I can hear her getting closer. Like I can hear her getting louder and louder and mm-hmm. louder. And then I hear the blowing. So I make the decision at that point, I'm done off this lead. I'm on the shelf. So I pull my gun out and I'm like, okay, let's just see what happens here. Well, about that time I see Kate's tail. So I reach down with my left hand and I grab her tail and pull her to me and when literally as she clears the hole and i'm standing i'm telling i'm standing two foot i could reach out and touch 
the bear. That's how close I was. As I clear the hole with her, pulling her back, here comes his head. Whoop. And he looks at me, and then he busts up out of there. And then when I realized how it was a you know good bear, that I ended up I shot I shot three times, and I still got her in my hand. Like I'm holding her. We're on this ledge. It goes up over the rocks and disappears. So I'm like, okay. So Wesley's hollering on the radio at me, like, "You all good? You good? Are you okay? Are you okay?" Yeah. So I have to get back up on the the top where the other dogs are. <clears throat> so I get Kate up there, get her tied up. I get on the radio and I said, yeah. And he said, what happened? And I said, well, it come out. And I said, this was a good bear and I didn't have nowhere to go. So instinctively I just started pulling the trigger. So I get her tied up and then I'm like, okay, now I mean, I'm in this mess. You got to crawl through it. Like mm -hmm. is the bear wounded? I don't want it to get away but I'm in here by myself. I'm already spent because I'm probably 11 plus miles in now. And so I'm like, okay, so my pup is over on the edge of the cliff, just booger barking, just boo, boo. You know how pups buck, booger bark. Yeah. So I reload my gun and I walk over, I get drunk back off the ledge and I start walk, walking the rocks where he went up and I'm start seeing blood. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, what's the best decision here? So I take Maggie, which is the old black female, because I know she's not going to get tore up. If she runs in on a wounded bear, she's just going to sit there and bark. So I put her down, back down in there and let her, she went around the hill 20, 30 yards, and she gave out one, just one bark. And then here she comes back, and I'm like, okay. So then I'm like, all right, now what am I going to do? So then I'm like, all right, Spook's my next best guess. Like, he's another one that don't get tore up, so I'll try him. So I done him. Now, the pup's still over here barking. So yeah. Spook goes around the hill, and he gives two two big balls out. just burr, burr. And then here he comes back. And I'm like, all right, so I guess I'm going to have to do this myself. So <laughs> I left Spook loose. <laughs> And Maggie had already tied up. So I start following the blood and literally I go up and over top of the cliff and over to the other side of it. And there's a big overhang ledge. I crawl through it because there's blood. And then when I crawl through it and I look up, there he's laying. So he yeah. was about 20 foot from where the pup was barking on the edge mm -hmm. of the, the ledge here over. So, yeah, I get everything tied up. And um, Wesley, I told and I tell them that, you know, he's down and he's like, all right, I'm going to start making some phone calls. <clears throat> and this is where our group, so this was at 2 o'clock-ish, somewhere in there, 3, I think I, maybe it was 3 when I shot that video. Yeah. Um, so it's going to get dark at 5.30. We are in no man's land. I mean, we are right in the middle of nowhere. There's no easy way in or out. So... I just tell everybody just to hang tight. Wesley's making phone calls. Of course, him and Clayter's there trying, they're coordinating for me. Um, we call Paul again, get his, get his help from his side. Uh, Michael, like whoever, whoever could hot rod and Cooper came to help. Um, so yeah, we, I ended up going ahead and taking the dogs up to a, a road above me and, <laughs> that's what we decided to do even though it was a 300 yard drag up it was way better than dragging three miles down so that's kind of what we did and we ended up getting out about 8 30 at night um and i mean the like greg come over he was at he was either working at home he ended up coming over yeah the you know, big sam dave fred all those guys stayed and made sure we got out made sure everything was good um mm -hmm. You know, you can't, I don't think people know how much you appreciate some of the things they do, even though they may feel like they're not doing a lot. Um, like nobody had to hunt that day, you know, it, it, it was just me. So, I mean, I'm very blessed to have the guys around me that I do. And like I said, it, you know, it was three o'clock or later. I mean, Michael left work and came to help, yeah. um, I'm sure I, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out here. I just don't I don't know who or what. But so yeah, to wrap this up, 
You need to have, did Garrett show up? No, he was working. He was working. He needed to show up to get that bear out. <laughs> Some of the places he's killed bear this year, the it, people he's been with have killed bear. You know, I, <laughs> I hate, like, you know, everybody's like, Heath, it's a good bear. Anybody would have done the same thing. You know, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not big on it. Like, I don't, I don't need to kill a bear. I don't have to kill a bear. And I didn't even have time to think or process what happened. Like it happened so Mm -hmm. fast. I had to pistol out for my own protection. The bear did not come at me. Um, We were definitely in close quarters and there was nowhere to go except around where he did. Um, But just instinct, instinctively, when I seen the size of it, um, I shot it and, you know, part of me wishes I'd have just left the darn thing. And, you know, maybe some, next year somebody had got him even a better bear. But, yeah. you know, the dogs did a phenomenal job. I mean, they walked that thing for about three hours in the rocks and the ledges and the cliffs. And, I mean, the majority of the time that I'm in that section that they're in, I end up getting run out. I mean, the dogs end up getting um, hung up and ledged out and the bear gets away. That just didn't happen. How I didn't get six dogs in that hole tore up is beyond me like it's it's amazing that they didn't because they were all i wished i'd have had a gopro or something that so i could show everybody what i was in and what a mess it was and and i just didn't i mean i didn't even pull my phone out because that that wasn't a thought in my head it was get the dogs out there make sure everybody's good so well that's that's the thing i mean you start getting phones out it's like that bear that i mean that bear lot that i got video of that one that was eight foot up in the tree Mm-hmm. You know, when he knew I was there, just some bears, you know, when you look at them, some of them just sit up there and they don't care. Mm-hmm. But some of them look at you like you're not supposed to be here. And so now you got a phone in your hand and you need to be having a gun in your hand yeah. or grabbing dogs or something like that. It's tough. Yeah. And it's I, tough. You know, I thought while I was sitting there trying to rest a little bit and get my legs back underneath me, you know, I was thinking if there would have been two or three of us in there, it would probably be even a bit bigger disaster, and the bear would have probably got away because none of us would have probably been prepared for that. You know, mm-hmm. me being in there by myself, there wasn't no other options. Like, get your gun out, yeah. get the dog out. Like, you know, that's what it was. But <clears throat> So Chelsea and I have had this debate, and, you know, the listeners can chime in on this, that she gets up and works out every morning, and she swears – that she's in better shape than I am. And yesterday and today, she's walking around like she's 80 on a cane. And I put in 14.2 miles. And I thought she was like the workout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's <laughs> learned very fast that bear hunting in that country is a lot different than doing Pilates here on, on the sofa. <clears throat> yeah <laughs> but yeah I asked her last night we walked out of the ball game last night and she was i mean she's hurting and i'm like yeah how's that how's that workouts working for you and she just told me to be quiet she didn't want to hear it she but probably told you to shut up she did <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but it was tough yep. yeah i mean it was you know it was a good day i mean you know the dogs did good work ever everybody you know like i said everybody kind of come to my rescue because I'd have been up there today. I'd have been up there all day getting it out by myself today. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'd have had probably had to quarter it up. I'd have probably had to done the same thing that Brad and him done because there's there's just no way I could have done it by myself. Right. So kudos to everybody that pitched in Tuesday. I mean, I can't, like I said, I can't thank you enough, and I don't think people realize how um, how much it means that you know, just like Fred, they they didn't have to stay there till nine o'clock at night. They could went home at three o'clock. You know, but they didn't. So, anyway, it, that's the thing. I mean, it's it's when you're hunting with a, a group, uh, you know, just by my nature, it's hard for me to. Uh, I, I like hunt. I, I coon hunt by myself a lot, and um, I like sneaking off by myself and bear hunting and walking those trails and getting in there where I feel like I'm the first white man that ever stepped foot in that country, you know, just me and my hounds. And, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important that, and I think the reason that those guys stick around for you, Heath, is because 
of all of the investments you've made in each other over the years and and helped each other. That's that's I like hunting with you guys. It's a lot of fun. Well, I mean, and I, I was thinking about it today. You know, we I went hunting this morning. I basically just rode around in the truck and let the dogs out a few times. But you know, if they would have called me, I mean, I would have left and went. I, if I was working, mm-hmm. I'd have said, "Hey, I got to get," and I'd have went over and helped them. I mean, I I wouldn't have given a second thought. And I think, you know, maybe Brad had said it or you had said it in one of the podcasts that, you know, the group is selfless. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody, nobody really cares who's doing what. We're doing it together. Right. So. Right. <clears throat> yep. That is, that's an important thing. So for sure. Well, that's a, that's a great story, man. Um, good bear, good dog work, good story, good teamwork. Yep. All good. All good. That's what bear hunting. Let's talk about. about. That's right. That's right. Let's talk about gear. Let's talk about. I think you know we're winding the seasons up and everything, and and uh, this seems like a logical place to take a break and talk about the companies that sponsor this podcast that can provide you the highest quality gear on the market. And I'm just going to throw some names out there. And tell you tell you about them. And and when we go out and we look for sponsorship, I'm not just looking for dollars. I'm looking for quality. There's a lot of junk out there, and people that are willing to uh, give you a little bit of money to peddle their junk. I ain't doing it. I'm not going there. If I wouldn't use it, I'm not going to talk to you about it on this podcast. So let's talk about Briar Creek Kennels. I'm I knew about Briar Creek probably in the early '90s. Well, it was the early '90s. And when Jim Ridge was running that company and, and, um, Jim, Jim built that company and, and built, built a reputation for Briar Creek. Now his son-in-law, Chris Girth, super guy that is also involved in securing your freedoms with a board position on the Hoosier Tree Dog Alliance. He's very active there. So when you spend your money with Briar Creek Kennels, you're not only getting high quality gear, you're also supporting, uh, 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 freedom you know i mean you are chris is able to use his resources and time to represent houndsmen in the state of indiana on the board for the hoosier tree dog alliance so check out briar creek next company i'm going to talk to you about is cajun lights and cajun outdoors i use their jacket their new coats awesome uh but when you hear me talk about the vest that I wear in this podcast, it's the Cajun Lights vest. It's laid out great. It's got the pockets I need. Um, you know, it's fully adjustable in and out. So if I'm layering up, then I can I can do that. If I want to throw a coat over, it's not so bulky that I can't keep my gear inside. The pockets are positioned well, so those antennas aren't slapping me in the face. Great vest. Highly recommend that. And then of course. Our friends at Dogs Are Treed. Check them out, folks. I mean, they've got they've got leash options there for you. Their their premium travel tieouts are second to none. They sell first aid kits. You're gonna hear a little bit about that in this podcast later on. They got high quality gear, as all of our sponsors do. We've made it super easy for you to find the best companies in the business to supply you with your gear. Go to houndsmanxp.com. Click on the Sponsors tab. All our sponsors are right there. If you can't find it there, I don't know what to tell you. So check us out at houndsmanxp.com. All the links to all those companies is right there. And don't forget to use those discount codes for price breaks. Guys, let's get back to the show and talk about some gear. We'll talk about some gear yeah, we'll talk about some gear stuff that that works and some of the stuff that we would get you know we would change or we we gotta you know we know we gotta change mm-hmm. and um uh, let's just start there let's let's just go from the ground up boots up to the hit, top of the head and uh talk about talk about everything in between all right you want to know what yeah. i'm wearing or what you gonna go with what you're doing well, I'll, I'll just describe my kit real quick. All right. Um, uh, my, so boot wise, I'm either wearing, um, uh, my, um, Russell boots or my Hoffman's, um, more Hoffman boots these days than the Russell's. And the only reason the Russell, the Ru- Russell's are great boots, 
but uh, they were gifted to me. Russell just changed hands and got new ownership, and their boots are priced way out of my range, and I don't want to replace them. So I'm kind of being, I'm kind of babying them a little bit. Uh, the uh, the Hoffmans, um, I'm not completely satisfied with them. Uh, I think on on wet rocks and different things, there's so so little flex in the ankles and in the sole that they they're pretty pretty slippery. Um, and I'm not real happy with the the toe box on that boot. Mm. I think I need actually it's a sizing issue on my end. I think I need to have uh, my foot sized properly by Hoffman and and let them tell me. I know other people that run Hoffman boots that, that won't wear anything else. But feet are, feet are different. You know, they're as different as footprints, mm-hmm. and everybody's feet are built different and things like that. And uh, so the Hoffman boots, uh, mixed reviews for me on Hoffman's. They, I wear, have to wear a thinner sock. They're not an insulated boot. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I wear the Mountain Explorer non-insulated. It's worked well, and I've been out there from early. I wore them from September all the way through January. And uh, with hound hunting, if you're active, your feet don't get cold anyway. And then inside that boot, I'm wearing a a merino wool sock. And then uh, pants, I'm usually wearing the First Light Sawbucks. Mm -hmm. It's a great pair of pants, turns briars. Uh, the only thing I would change on it is the pocket design. Uh, I've lost last year. I lost my billfold. Remember when I lost my billfold mm-hmm. last year and I had to go back and find my wallet. And, uh, uh, so they need to do something with the pocket design on that front pockets are great. They're wide, they're deep. Um, they've got a clip for your knife. If you carry a, a, a pocket clip knife, all that's good. But the back pockets suck and, mm-hmm. uh, they're just packed no pockets and they're pocket. slick. Nothing. Nothing. Yep. So um, I go up from there and I wear a Merino, first light Merino base layer on mm-hmm. top, uh, uh, first layer on that, on my upper torso. And then on the outside, you know, I'm usually wearing, I really like a shirt that I bought a long time ago. It's the Cabela's Microtex. Mm. If it's not too cold, if it's uh, 50 degree weather, that Microtex with that, that, um, Oh, the lightest weight first light. What is that? You said it the other day. The the, the, the super light one. The um, kiln. No, not the kiln. It's the it's the one under that. The wick. The wick. Yeah, yeah the wick. You know, I, I can wear a wick and that shirt all the way down to the forties and be good. And then, uh, uh, but it, when it starts getting colder, then I usually wear my King of the Mountain uh, jacket or that Asbel wool jacket that I've got uh asbel wool pullover and then uh head headwear get moving on up to headwear a lot of times i'll wear if it's cold out and i'll I'll do it when it's not so cold too i'll just wear a a handkerchief around my neck you know i like having that i can take it off and it's good for emergency purposes (laughs) if you need to sacrifice a piece of clothing for that emergency purpose it's better to lose a five dollar a handkerchief and to sacrifice mm-hmm. a sleeve off of a seventy dollar shirt, <laughs> so or a sock. I'm I'm not sacrificing a sock, you know, for that. And uh, headwear, I just usually wear uh, the hat I'm wearing right now. It's this Houndsman XP uh, tin cloth hat, and I I really like it. And if it's real cold, then I'll put one of those real thin uh, nylon liners. It's like a skull cap deal. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll just put on under it and and I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. So that's clothing wise. Where you, where are you running? <clears throat> um, a lot of the same stuff. Uh, I I've got several pair of boots, but I that I that I wear with my Kenatrex right now are for me um, my my favorite. Uh, mm-hmm. Training season, I've got the um, Chanae Kestrels. They're good, but after a lot of miles, they hurt my feet. My Kenatrex do not do that. So I've got, I'm wearing my Kenatrex. Same thing, Mountain Extremes. They're uninsulated. <clears throat> but, and I'm like you, I mean, my feet don't get cold because I'm usually constantly moving. But I do wear two pair of socks. I wear 
I've got the Kinetrek liner that I wear and yeah. that I wear and I wear the Kinetrek, the medium wool. So that's, that's what I wear as far as socks. And I, I started doing some research and the guys out West is kind of where I picked it up from because, you know, they're, they're glassing those mountains and they're hiking all day. And, um, I had, uh, the plantar fasciitis a couple years ago and it about put me under, I mean, my shoes were killing me and I just decided right then that that's one of the most important things that, that I can have. So <clears throat> that's what I'm using. And as far as pants, um, same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm running the first light saw bucks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Chris. I like, I like them. They're durable, man. If you get them wet, they dry really quick. Um, they're, they breathe, they are very stretchable. So when you get into these tight places like me the other day crawling, and I mean, I was putting one foot up at my chest, trying to climb up some of the, the cliffs and stuff. Um, so that's that I run the saw bucks and I do have the, um, the corrugated guide pants. I got the guides and the guide light. I run the guide lights a lot in August and September because they're very light, um, and comfortable. And then for my upper body, uh, the same thing. I mean, I've went to wearing a wick, a first light wick t-shirt or long sleeve. I have them both. And, I like the wick t-shirt. You know, I, I've always wore the cotton or whatever. And, you know, now that I'm, I'm able to, you know, get a few things that I've never had, I didn't realize how, how much difference it made wearing the wick stuff mm -hmm. keep you dry uh just like brad and him said the other day they were so like i said when i got back in the truck i was almost dry again um, yeah. so i wear, but they were wearing first light too what was going on with that they were wearing they didn't first have the light. base layers on like we did i think that was the thing i think Derek was wearing a base was wearing base layers was he i think uh, i'll we'll have to double check on mm -hmm. that so i wear them yeah wear, those guys those guys were wet well into the evening mm -hmm. And I was dry when I got back. Yep. Same thing. Um, so I wear a, I wear a base layer. My, I wear the wick, either, like I said, a t-shirt or a, a long sleeve shirt. In fact, I had a t-shirt and long sleeve shirt on Tuesday and I basically shredded my long sleeve shirt going through that stuff. So I'm going to have to get me another one. <laughs> Makes me want to cry. <laughs> First light should show, they should ship me a new, uh, a new green, um, uh, wick shirt. Yeah. But so I wear that. And then I'm kind of like you. I wear layers, depending on what the weather's going to be. Um, I I bought a couple years ago. I was at Cabela's in Pennsylvania, and I bought two shirts that was on sale. They're wool shirts, sweaters. They have a collar and three buttons on them. And they're redheads. Mm -hmm. um, I got a brown one and a green one. And for twenty dollars, that is the best investment that I've ever made. I can right. wear them. Like I said, they hold the water out. You don't get soaked down into your under layers. Um, so <clears throat> I wear them. And then if I need an extra layer, um, I have a, a first light catalyst jacket that I'll wear sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. It's got to be cold. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, and I, and I can shed the stuff too. Um, mm -hmm. so if I need it, I can, I can take it off. So and then up to my head, I'm like you. I wear my Houndsman XP hat um, if it's not hot or if it's not cold. And if it's down, you know, because I don't have no hair, I got it shaved off. I've got, I got an old car. Getting sympathy from me. <laughs> I got an old car heart toboggan <laughs> that I've had for 25 years. Right. You can see pictures of me back in the early 2000s with that car heart, that <laughs> toboggan. So yeah. it's kind of like a staple of my, me, but. That's the things that I wear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's what I wear as far as clothing and boots. And then, you want to say I, something? Well, I was, I was going to say, you know, I think, um, I think the number one mistake that's often made, especially for bear hunting, but coon hunting can be the same way. I mean, we hunted here uh, Tuesday evening and, and we got into some briar thickets and it was, I, I was a ringing mess when I came back, you know, even, even here. Uh, 
uh, we got into some terrain and stuff like that. But um, people just overdress too much. You know, it's uh, like I wear no base layers. I haven't worn base layer uh, long john bottoms yet this season hunting. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I take off, and everybody's different, I get that. Um, but but I just haven't. I just haven't done that, and and uh, I don't need to. I'm always worried about the core temperature, core, you know, keeping that core at the right temperature, uh, not overheat, don't get too cold. Uh, you know, with a wick, the day that, that uh, Brad killed that bear up there in that, that valley, you know, I, I started up the mountain and I started out and I thought, you know, I know what this climb is going to be. It's 2000 <laughs> foot elevation change in a short, short time. So, you know, the only thing I was wearing was a very, th and the temperatures were, there was ice on the trees. Mm -hmm. yeah, was, so the temperatures were in the high thirties mm -hmm. and I was carrying my pack. I had uh, a wool, my king of the mountain wool inside the pack and i just had that wick long sleeve base layer on and i just did the trip in that and um i wasn't cold and the ice was melting so it was kind of weird stuff man it was like an ice shower slash rain shower type thing going on there but with the energy that my body was using in the wick that that first light base layer just it just evaporating off of you as fast as it was coming down now once i got up there and we stopped moving and then the you know i layered back up i started putting i put another layer on to stay warm but uh, my my number one thing is it's always tempting when you get out of the truck and you're standing there and it is to is to throw on a coat or overdress or you know everybody does it everybody has done it i i did it the week before walking up that same trail i was overdressed and had to stop and and peel because i it was it was miserable yeah yeah <clears throat> so yeah i don't i've got a bad i've got a badland scout backpack that mm -hmm. um maddie will carry it with her and she'll put her a drink or two in there or you know i've, I've got a couple extra dog leads in it um, drink, she puts some drinks and some snacks and if, if we, if it's available, if she has it, um, you know, I'll take my shirt off and stuff down in her to whatever, if I need to, but if not, then I just tie it around my waist. But I, I basically carry, um, a chest rig and mm -hmm. I've had several in you know, the last couple of years. I've had the Dan's, um, it's got the two pockets on it and it's got the zipper where you can put stuff down it. Like it's made for a scorecard is what it's made for, for the comp hunters. Um, I like before we get in before we get into that that part, mm -hmm. Heath. Let's let's back up just a little bit. You know, I I get it, man. First light stuff uh, is expensive, and if you don't qualify for the discount program, then it, it you know it's out of reach for a lot of people. I, I want to talk about a couple small hacks that I've found that give you the same performance, same result. Um, I've been real happy with it. And so a couple of things that I've been using that for, and, and maybe a couple of tricks before we get too mo too far away from clothes. All right. I, I want to explain that. I don't think a lot of people realize the worst thing you can do is put your foot in a cotton sock and stuff it in a boot. Um, mm -hmm. I watched this happen in the Marine Corps. Uh, we'd get out of boot camp. You had no choice. You had to wear wool socks in boot camp. And there's a reason because natural material against your skin doesn't cause blisters. It also wicks moisture away from your feet. Uh, and people are like, eh, I don't like wool. It makes me itch. Well, you know, there's a lot of Merino wool options out there. Invest in a pair of good quality socks to go in on, on your feet. And before you put your foot in that sock, one thing that I've found that is extremely helpful is to get a can of air extra dry right guard whatever it is unscented it's in it i don't know if you want to spray secret on there with floral bouquet that's up to you uh, but spray your feet down with an antiperspirant and it'll keep your foot it'll keep your foot drier more dry and uh keep because a lot of 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 foot problems come from moisture and when you put a cotton sock on that cotton sock is holding that moisture right there it's causing a causing an abrasive 
surface against your foot and you're going to get blisters and your feet are going to get cold. If, if, if I always think like this when I'm dressing and when I'm packing to dress, if I get back up here in the mountains and I fall and I twist a knee or you fall off the ledge, like you, you were talking about in the, the beginning, how long are you going to be there before somebody comes and get, can get you, get to you and get you out of there? So when I'm dressing or when I'm pick, choosing my gear, I'm looking for ways that are not only comfortable and durable, but are also smart choices that are going to help me survive. Because when you're talking 40 degrees, you know, dark gets dark and the mountains is starting to drop into the 30s, it doesn't take long for hypothermia to set in. And you're wearing cotton and and you just you've just given it all up if you're wearing wool you're wearing you know good wicking material good insulating material uh, stuff that's not going to hold moisture then you're going to be able to to endure the cold and survive so so there is a a, a valuable part of this re- other than just for comfort you know <coughs> it's changed like the merino wool since i started buying it whether it be socks shirt you know, some, anything like, I cannot believe the difference that it's made in my comfort level. Um, Mm -hmm. like I said, you're, you know, you may get a little hot, take it off, but if it's cold, very seldom do I get cold. And the, the, like you said, the moisture is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. Like it wicks it away from your body and basically releases it and, like I said, my socks, like I said, I wear two pair of socks and, um, I, I've, I've not had the foot problems that I've had, that I had four or five years ago since I started buying a good quality boot and investing in some socks. And, mm-hmm. you know, talking about a hack, you can go, if y'all go get, get on Midway, Midway has a sale. Um, they'll have a sale probably right now at the end of the year, the beginning of the year, they'll yeah. have one midsummer. Like I bought a lot of my good socks from Midway on sale for half price. Right. So I buy a lot of stuff there too. Mm-hmm. Another place is Sierra. You can go to Sierra and find a lot of that stuff. You know, um, pants. I've been wearing the Wrangler outdoor wear pants. You buy them at Wally World. I hate to tell you folks, but uh, uh, your first light, if you look at the tags in your first light and you look at the tags in your gentry from Costco, they're probably made in the same shop in China uh, or in Thailand or Vietnam or wherever. There, are, Everything's made overseas. As much as I would like to, to buy 100% USA made, it's, it's just almost impossible to do it. You can't buy a pair of jeans in this country right now except for origin jeans. Um, and, uh, those jeans are like 180 bucks, but, uh, or 120 bucks. But anyway, my point is, my point is I like the Wrangler wear, uh, those pants. They make them in polar fleece lined and it's gotta be cold for, for me to wear those. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but just that I've cut wood in the, in just a standard, uh, six pocket pant, I've been cutting wood in them. I've been working around the place here in them. I wear them while I'm hunting. It's just, they're durable. I'm not going to lie. They're they're pretty nice. My buddy Larry Anderson uh, is the one that got me turned on to those, you know, a few years ago. And I didn't have a pair. I was wearing First Light at the time. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try those. They're 20, 23 bucks at Walmart. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're made out of a, a polyester blend material. And the they're not going to hold moisture and chafe you like a pair of jeans are. And, um, I really like those hack wise. I think I mentioned the, the Microtech shirt. That's not cheap stuff, but you can find it on sale from Cabela's Microtex is man. I've had that shirt for, I bet I've had it 20 years and it looks brand new. And I've, I've man, it, run it through the ringer. That's some tough stuff. Um, uh, we've talked about that down, jacket that both of us have that came from costco mm-hmm. you know you find a, a down coat on any of the big name hunting websites and it's going to cost you two hundred dollars plus yeah, a couple hundred dollars and they're these these coats are 
you know, forty dollars at Costco. Yeah, that's and been a that's, that's been a good. I lo- I love mine, and I wear it all the time. Yeah. I just I can't wear it in the woods because it picks so easy. Yeah, but and, wow. and that. <clears throat> And the, and the first light stuff wasn't made to wear in the woods yep. either. It was made for an insulating layer to wear under your catalyst coat mm-hmm. when you stop, when you're glassing, when you're, you know, you're stationary type stuff. Yeah. But none of them are made for that. And uh, it's just, it just is what it is, you know? Yep. So it's not like we're saying you have to go out and spend a bunch of money. There are options out there. If you shop and you shop smart and you, you bargain shop, try different things find out what works i'm i'm just saying that that my days of of you know taking on the mountain in a pair of blue jeans and or carhartt bibs and those days are gone for me i've found i've found better ways i used to do the same thing and i still have those same things that you're saying uh, oh yeah they're just hanging up yeah. downstairs and i'm not using them as much yeah yeah so let's get into some of the <clears throat> hardware stuff Heath, because, you know, you were talking about your rig. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, and I just didn't want to pass up the rest of that before we got yeah. got on to something else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I I'm a minimalist. I don't um, I don't like to take a bunch of stuff. Um, minimalist? Minimalist, yeah. Minim- <laughs> minimalist. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't like to carry a bunch of stuff. I'm, I'm a little bit bigger frame guy, and... You know, when I got stuff strapped on my back and I'm trying to crawl through those little thickets, it just makes me mad because I get hung mm-hmm. up, slung down, you know, I end up having to take stuff off and unhook it. So um, I carried a chest rig for a couple of years. It was a Dan's and it had, I'd stick my radio in one pocket and my, my Garmin, but I didn't like the antennas. So if anybody's listening, that's a designer. Nobody wants those antennas sticking up in their face and smacking them in the face for for eight hours a day got to turn right. those things to the side and put them down lower that's just you know and i know uh when we were at grand america last year i talked to havoc about that i'm like you gotta twist right. it turn this and move it um <laughs> <clears throat> so i carried it for a couple years the only downfall to it that i did well, there two things i didn't like the antenna smacking me in the face all the time and there was really nothing nowhere else to carry stuff so i was carrying my big my big herb backpack with it and that way i could stick my water and whatever else you know my knife and whatever else in my backpack so when we went out west last year or you know for we went to yellowstone i ended up buying a um paul had a a badland scout backpack so it's really small it's got two places for water bottles and whatever that's what maddie carries <laughs> if anybody else is with me and they want a smaller pack i let them use it I've got a couple of dog leads in there, extra dog leads. Um, you know, but there's always snacks in it. There's a light um, and a knife. So just a bear, bear stuff. But I don't carry that much. I carry, I've got a chest rig. It's um, an FHF and it's, um, it's small and it's got the, it's got the Molly. So I've got two, two radio pouches on it and again let's talk about the antennas my radio antenna don't stick up far enough to hit me in the face so i've got it adjusted where it sits down so i stick my radio in it and since garrett has taught us all a wonderful lesson about tethering your stuff down i bought a tether for it to make sure i don't lose my radio (laughs) (laughs) um i need to find a tether for a radio charger i still can't find my charger oh yeah wesley was asking me about his today and i'm like i I don't have it um so the other pouch i actually stick a water bottle water bottle fits perfectly down in it it's right here on the front and that's what i put in it and then you know with my garmin i've got a carabiner on it i just hook it to the strap of the of the chest rig and carry it on the outside now if you open that chest rig because it's got a big pocket in it that expands <clears throat> which I really like. Um, and it's actually got some dividers in it and it's got um, some Velcro where I can add different pockets if I want to. But inside I carry, um, I don't like to lead dogs. Anybody that's around me knows that I'll keep my young dogs on a double or triple coupler. So I carry a couple extra couplers in my, in there, my pistol slides right down in it. 
You don't even, I mean, you never see it. You don't even know I have it. It slides right down in it. I carry a knife. Um, and yesterday or Tuesday, I had a pack of crackers and um, one of them fudge rounds in it. That's what I had at three o'clock while I was sitting there <laughs> trying to decide how I was going to get out of that mess. Fudge rounds. I had a fudge round, so I got my sugar fix. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's basically what I carry. And then the you know the dog leads. And here's one thing that I struggle with is the weight of the dog leads. You know, mm-hmm. some people may not mind, some people may not pay attention to it, but I'm gonna tell you after 14.2 miles Tuesday. And that may not be a lot for some guys, but for this big fat boy, it was a lot. Um, you know, I, I'm used to doing eight to ten miles. Um, it was a little that was a little bit that was on that was on my upper end of what old Heath can handle. But the dog leads get so heavy. Mm-hmm. In fact, when I left Chelsea in the path, we had we had we had seven dogs, we had seven dog leads. That's what we brought. I told her to keep a couple because I knew when I was going to pull up through there, there's just going to be extra weight. So when well, if I you got, didn't have, if you didn't have dogs that would chew the damn things in half, you could carry <laughs> something lighter. Well, you wouldn't have to carry log chains with you, Heath. I know, I know, <laughs> but the weight of leads absolutely kills me. I hate it. I hate carrying them. Um, but yeah, I carry, if I've got six dogs, I carry six leads. And then, like I said, a couple of my leads are doubles. So you can hook up two dogs mm-hmm. and then, I always have a couple extra couplers in my in my pack with me. What about the hiker light? <clears throat> the, the what? Hiker light from the hiker light lead from from Dogs Are Treat. It's just a mm-hmm. cable cable lead. Have you have you not seen mine? I actually have one. Yeah. Um. um I enjoy carrying that lead. <clears throat> I like it. I. The thing that I would do is. Uh, uh, make the snaps a little bit bigger and it the the cable end on it the cable's small so you need to make sure that you put the you know you put the loop in it when you're handling dogs it because that that smaller cable can pinch and mm-hmm. yeah it can lay into your head <clears throat> pretty good there but uh there's a couple hacks for that too um one of the things that i do and i've i, I kind of learned this from uh Mike Colley down in Louisiana, he makes a lot of his own leads out of hollow core rope and different things because they're tying hogs and different stuff like that. If you got a dog that chews, it's not going to work for you. Um, but uh, you can make, if you get some hollow core rope and do kind of a Chinese finger cuff feed back in through it and put a snap on each end, it works pretty good and they don't weigh anything. You can stuff four or five of them in the pack. Well, don't don't easy. feel bad. Garrett's dog paid me paid me back for my dog chewing your lead, cause it What'd got two of, it got two of mine. Good. Yeah. So it was a Good. two for one deal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but uh, leads are always a pain. And I've seen some guys that have made their own leads out of um, kind of like ski rope, the yeah. nylon ski rope. And yeah. I always thought that that was like. Man, then then would be light. The only thing you'd have is the weight of the the snaps on them. Um, I've just never done it myself. And I've even actually, we bought a bunch of paracord to make our own paracord. And the two leads that I got chewed up, Hunter actually made me two paracord leads. And they are a little bit lighter than your regular lead. Um, But yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing for me. If I could find a lighter, lighter way to go. I would definitely sure. take it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. I my pack my pack situation. I'm gonna have to. Uh, I carry an Everly stock gun runner. It works great in the West, but it's got a top pouch on it, and um, that top pouch can get hung on stuff. The nice thing is, is if you're on the trail and uh, just got to make time. You know, instead of uh, if you're carrying a long long gun or rifle, it's got a gun scabbard built right into it. It's it it's great out west. It's marginal to a pain in the ass in the laurel thickets. Mm-hmm. You know, you got if you're carrying a long long gun, then you're just better off pulling it out. And, you know, just carrying it at that point. <laughs> um, do you carry any first aid stuff? You carry any first aid stuff on you? 
not on me, but my truck is, I've got a whole kit in my truck, but you'd have to get back to my truck. But no, I, I don't. Mm -mm. You don't carry a tourniquet in your pack or anything like that? I mean, I've got my belt. Um, yeah. And my belt would definitely work because it's, it's a stretch, stretchable belt, so I could put it in mm -hmm. and, and wrap it up. I'm going to so. use your belt on you yeah and i carry i actually carry a tourniquet in in my pack mm -hmm. um it's it's just cheap insurance mm -hmm. in case for whatever reason you know i don't know belt doesn't work or whatever but that tourniquet especially with our training mm -hmm. you know we've we've been trained on how to put them on for ourselves and yeah. and uh you can definitely do it with a belt. I've been trained on that too, but, but at the same time, man, you got that tourniquet that's dedicated for that purpose. And I, and I carry a first aid kit too with, with some, um, some pretty basic stuff, but it's some stuff that get a knife cut, man. And it can, it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it can turn bad on you pretty quick. You know, I've got, I've got enough packs laying around from from my job because you know over 20 years i've accumulated a lot of stuff i've probably got enough stuff or even a pack already laying around with stuff in it that i could strap to my chest rig on one of those mollies um, yeah so maybe that's something next year that i may improve on but i've thought about the tourniquet and i thought well okay i've got my belt um but i've got i've actually got three extra tournament tourniquets um in my desk drawer at work um, I carry one. We carry one on. I got one on my my tactical Dude, vest. No. I got yeah. one on my regular vest. I've got mm -hmm. um, two in my car. One's in my door, my my car, and the other one's on my back and my in the back of my car, where I keep all my stuff for Pino. So I've I've got. I mean, I've got all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's something that we don't pay enough attention to. You know, Josh Josh Whitaker uh, was hunting. I think he was down in Sonora and ran a knife in his leg Ooh. and uh, I, he might have barely nicked the femoral he. with it but i mean it was it was it was serious and um you know in that situation right then say somebody does you know you're skinning a bear and you're sitting there and you got that leg up and you're and you're coming down there and all of a sudden that knife slips and and hits you in the inside of your thigh and you nick your femoral and now you got a you got an arterial bleed you're going to have to figure out how to get that stopped and then direct quickly. pressure is not going to do it quickly you know yeah yeah so yeah. i started i started carrying the tourniquet stuff i and i feel better about it i do and it doesn't weigh anything yeah you know? no you're right and i've got i i mean i've got quick clot laying everywhere everywhere that's right quick clot i've got it too yeah. yep mm -hmm. yep yeah, I th For maybe sure. I'll I'll upgrade and make. I mean, I've like I said, I've I've even. I mean, I've got a a green a green little pouch with the first aid symbol on it. Um, I've got like I said, I've got one on my tactical vest. I, I've got one laying another another one laying somewhere. I mean, our department's good about furnishing you with that stuff. So yeah, um, I'm sure I can <clears throat> find something laying around that I can use. Yeah, yeah. What else haven't we covered? Weapons. We don't need to talk. Do you want Weapons. to talk about firearms? We've been rolling an hour. We want to save yeah. that one for another one? Yeah, we'll do whatever. Yep. We can cover it in 10 minutes, can't we? Yeah, yeah, easily. Yeah. I'm hungry. My yeah. supper's ready. <laughs> yeah, I eat. So, yeah, I carry, I, I mean, I'm a dinosaur. Y'all have called me a dinosaur. I carry an old 41 Magnum. It's a Taurus Titanium. So it mm -hmm. is really light. Uh, I bought that that gun in 2003 um because i carried an array of different weapons i mean i i was even carrying my 40 um h and k at one point in time and <clears throat> i carried a 357 for a couple years um after the first couple years i bear hunted i realized right then i did not want to carry a rifle um i you know i get a lot of training with uh with a handgun so i feel pretty confident with the weapon system <clears throat> and you know i mean i have no desire to kill a bear anyway even though i just did it but um you know it's basically used for emergency situations only so i choose to carry the pistol i do also have 
Um, a couple years ago, I bought a Marlin 336 um, 3030, and I'd done some upgrades to it. I changed, I took the forearm off and put um, uh, um, not a Picatinny on it, but um, I put an M-Lock uh, AR uh, forearm on it, and it's it already had a Picatinny rail on the top, so I added a Vortec. I do like Vortec. I added a Vortec Venom, which is a red dot <clears throat> system, mm -hmm. and I've actually got a... I've got one of those mounted on a pistol. Yeah, um, and I, I, that's what I run on my shotgun turkey hunting, too, is the, the Vortec Venom. And I have a burst. I like a burst. The burst is almost the same thing. The the um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I've got the 3030. And I'll give it, if somebody wants to, if somebody's going with me and they, you know, they need a weapon, you know, I'll let them use it. I usually just throw it under the seat of the truck. Um, it's there in case I need it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what, that's the two weapons that, of my what bullets course. you shooting at them. What, what rounds are you shooting at them? So in the 3030, I'm shooting the core lock 170s is mm -hmm. what I'm shooting in it. <clears throat> um, the, the, my 41, I know this is bad, but I had a guy load me a <clears throat> hundred rounds in 2007. Still shooting those same bullets because I've got them all. <laughs> yeah. uh, other than the ones at Wesley. Minus three. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Wesley's first bear years ago, he run out of shells with his pistol. <laughs> then he grabbed my pistol. I reloaded my pistol. He run out of shells with it and was asking for force. <laughs> So, <laughs> oh, oh, shaky. He, he couldn't stand it, but, um, but yeah, I, they're 230 grain. Um, they're not hollow points. They're just, uh, lead, just lead mm -hmm. shells. So yeah, that's what, that's what I'm using in it. Um, like I said, I, I've shot that gun a couple of times throughout the years, just making sure that, you know, the sight picture and everything's good. But yeah, I mean, I, I still have a lot. I probably, I probably still have 75, 80 shells and that's count. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Wesley's went through a dozen of them. And then, you know, the, the time or two that I've shot a bear throughout the years and then just shooting it. So I, I probably, I probably have 20, I still probably have 75 shells left. Yeah. yeah. So what about you? I see you carrying a pistol, chest rig. Yeah. I carry a, uh, <coughs> Smith and Wesson 44, combat magnum mm -hmm. uh it's loaded with underwood mm -hmm. solids um yeah i'm i i'm not shot him shot a bear with it yet but i just um there's been the 44 was king for a long time you know and and mm -hmm. uh um i'm kind of old school wheel gun i know that uh you've heard me talk about the 10 millimeter before Mm -hmm. And and I I would be totally comfortable because I carried a, a semi-auto for twenty five years. I mm -hmm. don't know. We started out with wheel gun, then we transitioned to to semi-autos. Had semi-autos in the Marine Corps and things like that. But you know, the thing about a wheel gun is is uh, it's got to be a catastrophic failure for that thing not to go off yep. when you pull the trigger. And um, you're not worried about double feeds and stove pipes and you know, uh, limp wristing it and, and having a malfunction or not having the right grip. Um, you know, it's, it's just dependable and that's the name of the game for me. Uh, I want it to be dependable. So, and maybe I want to be a little bit retro too with the, <laughs> the old wheel gun type thing, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the handgun I'm carrying. I carry that in a, um, Oh, what is that? What is that? Uh, chest rig I'm carrying. I got it right here. It's a Kydex holder. You got? Did you have somebody yeah. make that for you? No, no. I'll I'll post a link to it. I can't yep. remember the name of it. It's a it's a it is a popular brand. I'm gonna have to look it up. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Dag on it. I'm embarrassed. Uh, it's because I don't know what chest rig that it, what chest rig that is, but it's it's a fairly popular brand. It's it's well known, but it's a well made holster. Yeah, I um, like it. And you know, it, go ahead. No, so you know, go back to the pistols that I've carried over the years. Um, I've tried all types of of 
carries. I've tried to carry it under my armpit, you know, mm -hmm. the one that got the shoulder that goes under. Um, it's fine as long as you got a jacket over it because it yeah. don't get hung up. But then if you take the jacket off and then it's hung, I mean, I've literally lost that weapon three different times. I've had to go back and find it because it fell out. Mm -hmm. um, so then I went to the side holster on my hip and again, well, see, I, I always carried there, too, because that's where I always carried a pistol. Mm -hmm. So and go ahead. Then, so I was carrying it on my hip, and I found the same thing, that getting in the thickets and stuff, that strap would pop off. And then I was constantly checking to see if it was there. And if you put on a lot of miles, it's kind of just like your duty weapon. You know, if you, keep, if you put on a lot of miles, it puts pressure right on that hip bone. And you'll mm -hmm. be sore. Um, and now, you'll work it out through yeah. the season. So I'm like, all right, so now what? Um, so if I wasn't carrying it in, in my chest rig, I would be carrying it on my side. That that mm -hmm. would be where I carried. Um, I do like the chest. In fact, I had the the chest rig with the, um, uh, I can't remember the, the rig I had, but it went down in the molly, kind of just like yours. I had, a, it went down through the molly. It was a 45 degree angle where I can mm -hmm. just reach down and, and pull it out. But I didn't, right. like I said, when you're going through the brush and stuff and you're crawling through the laurels and your head, your head's bent down, you got to pay attention because it, I had a hard time making sure that it was staying in. Really? Yep. Yeah. With, with the FHF? No, 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 not with that. Oh, the old rig. The old, the old rig. rig. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing that <clears throat> I always carried in a side carry on the hip, I carried um, uh, a Blackhawk uh, retention holster and um, carried there. And what I found was with with uh, waist belts and different things on some of these packs, then it would interfere. Mm -hmm. And it, and but I was a I. You've heard you've heard this old cop stuff. <clears throat> you know, best way to get in trouble is to start changing holster locations and gun platforms you know carry carry what you know mm -hmm. motor skills your look you know i know where that pistol's supposed to be it's been there for the last 30 years of my life so i was really apprehensive about switching and uh i just went to the chest rig and put in put in some range time and just got used to to looking for it there i don't think i've got enough reps with it that if it gets real out there i don't you know I think I'll go there, but I've been down that road before. And and you start changing platforms and and uh, holster designs, and you can get yourself in trouble. So yeah, um, usually it's not that it's not that intense that you got to worry about it, but it's something you got to be conscious of uh, when you're carrying a pistol. But um, we could always be like Gary and carry our ten millimeter in the front pocket of our Carhartt bibs. <laughs> Without I'm surprised a, he hasn't lost that. magazine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's he's, for, he's that's still for safety. For stuff. He's got stuff <laughs> spread out through three counties out through there. <laughs> Me and Hot Rod told him he was going to follow him around until his wallet dropped, and then we was going to steal it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Long gun. You know, I I threw the old lever gun in this year, the 44 mag leather, lever mm -hmm. gun. I wanted to see what uh, one, of these Underwood, one of these Underwood bullets would do coming out of that that 44 mag rifle i bet it's the real deal yeah I, but, i'm uh, meant to order some of that ammo and i just haven't done it but i'm i'm gonna have some before next year we're gonna we're gonna be working on some of that here next week at the shot show right yeah when we're out there yeah. but uh yeah but traditionally i'll tell you the rifle i really like i've seen some bears and it just i've seen some bears kill with it i've killed a lot of deer with it and uh that's that 350 legend, that Ruger Ranch 350 mm -hmm. legend. Mm -hmm. It is short. It's a bold action rifle, so you, you know it's dependable. It's magazine fed, um, and it's it's got a synthetic stock on it, so you can't hurt it. Uh, the barrel length is only like 17 inches long, so it's small and compact. <clears throat> and that 350 legend round, if you do the research on it, I mean it's pushing a it's pushing a 180 grain bullet down or 170 grain bullet down range at 2200 feet per second and uh, it's a straight wall 556 five, casing that's not been necked down so i mean it is hot and yeah. uh, 
it absolutely puts the smokes on them. You know, mm -hmm. it's a great, it's a great rifle and just the convenience and everything of it. And I've just got a, a, a Leupold Delta point pro non, uh, magnification. It's just a, uh, you know, red dot side mm -hmm. is all it is. And, uh, that's one thing that Brad and Derek were, you know, they were curious about when, before they came out for their bear hunt is, you know, what do we carry? And I, I told them, um, you know, stay away from scopes. Mm -hmm. I, um, especially if you're walking into a bay up in a bear hunt, you know, finding a bear in a scope and being able to tell the difference between a bear and a dog and whatever, you know, it, it gets, it gets, it gets pretty intense. So mm -hmm. I like shooting open sights or non, uh, magnifying sights on, on bear. Yeah. And the thing with the red dot is, you know, I, I like to shoot both eyes open. So me too. Like I can watch, I can get on that dot and I'm still, I mean, I'm still got both eyes open and I, that's the way I prefer to shoot. Um, so I, that's why I like the red dot because it just yep. fits right into what, you know, what I'm already doing. And I mean, we, right. you know, we have them on our system, weapon systems at, at work on our pistols. We have them on our rifles. It's what you're familiar with. <clears throat> yeah. So. Yep. Yep. It's good. Yep. Well, I think that's a pretty good wrap up on, uh, on gear. Yeah. Got anything else to add? No, I mean, just go with what works. And I mean, I, I will say, like I said, over the years, I've, I've morphed into what I do now. Um, a lot of it just was just being young and dumb and this is what I had. This is what I did. Um, that, well, you got to do that. Yeah. You know, but when I first started out, I was wearing hand-me-down shoes, you yeah. know, work boots and stuff, whatever I could find. I remember putting stuff putting friggin' bread bags over my feet in my mm -hmm. boot to keep my feet from getting wet. Oh, yeah. And then um, your feet sweat so bad, you come home yeah. and take your cotton sock <laughs> off and it's wring them wet. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the wool, the merino wool has made a huge difference in my comfort level. It's, it's, it's a game changer. I mean, it's, that's, it's a game changer. Um, my feet don't bother me. Like I said, the, the most, if you told me I, I could only have one thing, out of what I do, it would be my boots. Like it would mm -hmm. be my boots. That would be because if your feet can't go, you can't go. That's right. Um, so that would be the one thing, but yeah, um, just go with what works and try different things. And if you can find, <coughs> find wool, the Merino wool or just regular wool and, and learn to dress a little bit differently in layers. I mean, I think it would be a, a huge help to people if they're, if they're not already doing it. And I'm sure a lot of guys are like, y'all are so far behind times. Man, I'm just right. picking up right now. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's a good one, Heath. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you yeah. taking time. And if you guys have any questions or comments, make sure you're reaching out to us on our social media platforms. Heath and I are both on Go Wild. Mm -hmm. And, um, man, if you're not using Go Wild, get over there and check it out. You're earning points every time you're posting. When you buy stuff, you earn points to get other discounts. Uh, when you post trophies, Heath, he's tearing it up because he's posting all these trophies, uh, tree and free bears that are knocking down like 400 points at a time. Mm -hmm. I, did, I had to break out some old stuff so I could pull back ahead of you. Have you seen that? <laughs> I didn't do anything for training. See, I thought today, I'm like, you know what? If I go back to training season, but I had. And, yeah, and so here's, just... here's the key. <clears throat> you, you, you log the trophy. Go ahead and log your time. Where you at? I can't see it. I no, can't go see ahead. Go ahead. I'll add it to the end. Uh, but uh, uh, you log your trophy and you get your points there. Don't forget to log your time because you get points for that. And then you just go over to the bear hunting and post a picture of your dog and say, and, and you know, make another post. You're triple, you're, you're, you're loading up on those go wild points, those discount points. And, uh, one thing I would tell you is when you shop at go wild, we have more dog gear there and it's, there's more coming. I had just had a meeting with them a couple weeks ago about some necessities that they need to have in stock and they're upgrading right now. And, don't forget to use our promo code HXP10, all capital letters, HXP10. You get 10% off every day and free shipping. So go wild. It's a great place. Yeah. Talking and, to like-minded people every time. 
Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying. The more I use it, the better uh, I'm getting at it. And I I can post my stuff there, and I don't have to worry about it. And of course, I don't yep. post anything that I that you know out of the way anyway. But um, but guys, over the next couple months, Go Wild is doing some promotion, and they're doing some major promotion incentives. Um, I'm just going to briefly touch on them. We'll hit them in some future uh, podcasts, but they're doing a Go Wild Challenge mountain tough where they're going to give away utv uh that's probably going to be in february it'll run through february so <laughs> you need to get on that um the next one they're going to do is uh the great the great outdoors show which is going to run from february 4th to the 12th so they'll be at booth 412 if you guys happen to go to that or in the area go over um if you've got a uh, a shirt, a hat, or something that you're wearing, they're going to give away some free stuff. Garmin, Vortec, Tacticam. Like, I would have loved to have had a Tacticam with me the other day. And then yeah. the third, <coughs> they're doing another one. Um, let me see here what it is. The UTV giveaway and uh, the Mountain Tough, and then the Outdoor Show. So, guys, go over to Go Wild. Look that stuff up. It's very simple um to follow the guidelines and what they're doing and man it would be great to win some of that stuff they're giving away some great prizes at the outdoor show and the utv is you know i'd love to have one so guys go over there get a hold of it get on it and join up the houndsman xt houndsman xp team is all there houndsman xp also has a page over there so make sure you go over there and you give us a like and a follow follow there too so um even wes even our old buddy wesley and forrest have have accounts over at go wild yeah and hot, rod, hot, rod, hot, rod's, hot rod's got an account garrett's got an account I, hey if brad all the cool people are Garrett there are listening to this man i've got them on board woo woo we on the train now that's right uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting them i'm getting them loaded up that's right that's right oh man what a hoot all right, buddy. Well, hey, let's let's wrap this one up. What do you think? Yep. Hey, one thing I'd throw out there. If one last thing, I keep saying, we'll wrap it up. Go over and check out. I just got the opportunity to be on the uh, Ohio Outdoors podcast, O2 podcast. Hey, uh, Chris, you're on mute. How did I hit mute? I don't know, but I heard the outdoor podcast or Ohio outdoor or something. And then it just cut off. Yeah. So go over and check out the O2 podcast. I got the opportunity to sit <clears> down <throat> over there with them and, and, uh, talk about hound hunting, introduce, uh, they're, they're mainly a deer hunting podcast or, you know, an other type hunting podcast and do a lot of whitetail stuff. And any time we can take the message out there and talk to deer hunters, we need to open up those lines of communication. It was a real pleasure to be able to do that. So um, if you guys go looking for a podcast to listen to this week, it's nice to be the guest because you get to know me a little bit better, kind of know more about my background and and uh, hear me hear me un, you know unwind a little bit. So that's all I got, Heath. I'll shut up. All right. All right, man. Until next time, you follow your hounds and I'll follow mine. See you later. <laughs>